All right, so here's the QEG map, and this is Alex's, and he had this uh, excess theta. Now, you see that a lot with ADHD, right? And um, so that's the classic marker. So I felt like I could justify, you know, compromising with the parents. Okay, we're gonna do this one protocol to try to, you know, bring that down. And, uh, but that's also limbic activity. Okay, that theta is the rhythm of the limbic system. And he's, he's just, his limbic system is blowing and going. He's got another marker that I see a lot with anxiety. Uh, right in this area of the brain, uh, which gets over aroused with anxiety, PTSD. It's called the cingulate gyrus. Also has a lot to do with obsessive compulsive kinds of symptoms. It's a part of the brain that has associations between cognition and limbic function. And so if people who just can't go to sleep at night wondering if they lock the door and keep getting up and locking the door, that's part of that OCD loop in the brain. It's not letting go, right? It has to let go. <laughs> it's like, done, finished. I'm, I don't have to work right now. And, uh, but his is staying on full alert all the time. Plus, he has another marker in the back of the head. His alpha pattern is almost non-existent. And uh, Paul Swingle calls that a trauma marker. He also calls it a bully marker. But you'll see kids like this, and their brains are just going 90 to nothing, and they don't idle down. Our brains go into idle when we're sitting and relaxed. We've got our eyes closed and we're not working on anything. You just see this beautiful alpha coming out of the back of the head. Not him, okay. So he's got some markers in his, in his QEG. And when I was talking about the, uh, the three-dimensional, it's called Loretta, low-resolution electromagnetic topographical analysis. Okay, so it actually is able to, uh, with all kinds of crazy math formulas, figure out where in the brain certain kinds of activity are, are coming from, okay? And uh, it's highly specific. And uh, here's an example. You know, I can see areas of the cortex that are over aroused or under aroused. This is not his, I'll show you his in a moment. This is uh, the whole regimen of treatment and we did several uh, or four different types of protocols and we ended with this uh, three-dimensional. Now, that, what I was able to do is I was able to focus on his right amygdala, which was over-aroused. This is how we ended the treatment. Even at that time, it was still over-aroused, so the feedback was based on him calming his right amygdala. Plus, we also had a protocol that's built in the software that was developed by the Department of Defense and the VA for uh, veterans with PTSD. So we had that protocol in, plus chill out the amygdala on the right side. And uh, you can imagine, uh, you're gonna do what to my head? <laughs> you're gonna put a cap on my head? And what's that cap gonna do? And uh, these wires, where do they go? You're gonna shock me? I mean, he had a jillion questions. That's great. He's asking questions. He's not climbing up the wall screaming. Questions are good. I'll take questions. And we just explained and explained and explained and explained, okay? And uh, after a while, he kind of thought, this is pretty cool, you know? And uh, when it was all said and done, it's like, we're not going back to Dr. Jones's for neurofeedback? And uh, we actually had a couple of just social visits. Just come back, say hi. Can I do the neural feedback? Yeah. Now we're kind of done with that. You know. so. uh, perseveration, if you're familiar with that concept. In his geography lesson one uh, week, they were studying the different, just, just a small part of it was, uh, you know, there, these, these types of snakes in Arizona. Oh my God, everything was snakes. Snakes, 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 snakes. He was anxious, he was obsessing, and that's perseveration. 
okay? He just gets locked on it and uh, can't let go. Um, and, and this is one of the things we had to be very careful about our terms. Try not to use brain anatomy terms, biological terms, anything that had any pathology sound to it. You know, we were just trying to make him, his brain better and I'm trying to make him happier. That's, that's basically what we were doing, okay? <coughs> By session 10, uh, we're finally getting improvement in sleep and he's calmer during the day. Uh, by session 15, he was, uh, had better focus in studying. His handwriting improved. This dysgraphia thing is still kind of a mystery to me, but it ties in somehow with cognitive functioning. I've seen it too much. Session 29, symptoms improved um, overall, but he was still having uh, episodes of dissociation. Okay, it was about that time that he was doing so much better that the parents decided, let's go on a trip to California so you can meet your adoptive grandparents. Okay? Wow. Okay, so they, they had him all ready. They get on the airplane. Guess what happens? Two knuckleheads get in an argument, verbal, about the seat across the aisle. Okay? Panic attack, right? But mom used her grounding techniques. He settled down. They were able to stay on the plane and weathered it. So that was improvement. That's one of those where I wish I could meet those two guys. <laughs> really? You know? <laughs> After session 39, we were seeing improvements in all the checklist items. Okay, this is where your amygdala is located. And uh, one of the protocols that uh, Fisher developed is putting an electrode right here. Now, getting people to agree to that is another matter, but you, you're pasting it on there with this pasty, sticky stuff. And you have to do it with your eyes closed. But if you look at the brain anatomy, these, this is the prefrontal cortex or the orbital uh, lateral prefrontal cortex right here. This part of the brain has all kinds of connections to the limbic system, right? And it moderates the activity of the amygdala. So if you can get the prefrontal cortex to quit sending alert messages to the amygdala, the amygdala will chill out more, right? It's the idea that she's come up with. And um, so we, with the feedback, we were targeting with the Loretta, we were actually just targeting directly this area, but we also used some of her training. She says one of the effects might be heightened senses of smell. Well, you're right there by the uncus in this area, which is where, you know, can be affected, uh, can affect our <laughs> sense of smell. Uh, when we started this uh, session one of this, tr this protocol, he had an ab reaction this traumatic memory came up, okay? Well, Seaburn Fisher was our guide, and she, there it is. She talks about that. Mom was reading it. I was reading it. I was familiar with this whole thing anyway, and we, we talked about that. You know, this could elicit some ab reactions. It's not, not a bad thing if you're able to therapeutically work with it. Uh, and he started becoming very sensitive to odors. Okay? I, I don't want to get off the track too much, but one of the big triggers is the olfactory. And uh, I think that's one of the, can be one of the most powerful triggers in women with PTSD who have been raped. The smell of the guy. Okay? And it's all tied in. Uh, the sense of smell is the only sense we have that does not get regulated through the cortex, straight in to the sensory cortex, okay? It's not felt. Sight, everything else goes through the cortex and is modulated, not smell. So it can be one of the most powerful um, elicitors of a trigger. Uh, but he calmed down, okay? 
I can only imagine the stuff he was smelling in this environment he grew up in, right? And uh, so I've already talked about, uh, about that, okay? This, this software will read the EEG, digitize it, compare it to a normative database, and use that calculation to determine the feedback given every second, and it's calculating that 30 times a second, okay? So it's looking at the brain, this is too high, this is too low, on average, okay, you get to watch the uh, cartoon, okay? <laughs> okay, we'll brighten up the cartoon. Next second, nope, <laughs> and, it, and it gives that feedback. It's amazing stuff. He had over arousal of his right amygdala. That red means it's above average. And um, I mean, boom, the first session, his, and this was an interesting turn. His mother said, you know, he slept a lot after that session, and he took naps. He never takes naps. He never slows down. And uh, after the fourth session of this, it's like a four-hour nap. She was like, what's with this? You know? And uh, I think it's the brain just kind of letting go, you know? I don't have to be on alert anymore. In fact, a nap sounds kind of nice, you know? So the results of symptoms, uh, you can see the average symptom. We track these symptoms uh, throughout the whole process. Pre-treatment, mid-treatment, post-treatment, one-year follow-up. You can see the averages came down. And um, so the pre-treatment, all kind of riding up here at the top in the scores. These were Likert scales. Mid-treatment are in the red. Uh, things, some things were coming way down. Some actually went up a little. And uh, the negative thoughts, for example. Uh, at the end of treatment, uh, things were significantly reduced. We did a one-year follow-up, both parents. And uh, even uh, so our results were holding, right? And so here's just the average symptom rating. Lower is better, okay? This is very problematic. This is not problematic. So here's the before and after uh, using the same uh, scaling. Uh, after five sessions of this particular type of feedback, we could see a reduction in the arousal of his right amygdala, okay? Well, that made sense. Right, it fit, okay. All right, two months after treatment, his mom sent me this video. I believe it was at the Duseum. Did they have this wall at the Duseum? Okay, now this is the kid who was so anxious that we had to talk a long time about putting something on his head. This is the kid that would freak out if people had an argument, right? Okay. <laughs> it just blew my mind. He's going all the way up, and he's just going to let go when he gets up and float back down. I was like, is that the same kid? <laughs> it was like, wow, okay? And uh, that's what happens. You know, you combine the different types of therapy, you're getting at that neurology, okay? And uh, so it really begins to make a difference. Okay. Anybody remember this scene? Okay. I remember it vividly uh, because I was there, right there. That's Mrs. Carroll, my fourth grade teacher, and that was our student teacher. And this is John F. Kennedy and Jackie. And I don't know what John Connolly's saying, but she thought it was pretty funny. And uh, that was the morning of November 22nd, right? And uh, by the time we all got packed up and went back to the schoolroom and were sitting in the lunchroom, they came over and said he had been shot, okay? So, Leading up to my next little discussion question, and I do want you to pair up or get in triads or little groups. Discuss the ways you think children generally are affected by the news of mass shootings. The news of it. Now, I happened to see the man that morning. Okay. It, it, 
it affected us. But, and some of you have probably had discussions or seen that come up, but let's, let's break up for just a little talk with each other. And uh, how do you think it's affecting kids?